thank you very much. Gosh, after that introduction, I feel I must be about 150 years old to have done all of that. But thank you very much for that, Robert. And thank you for giving me this opportunity this evening, which I'm very excited about and thrilled to see so many people in the audience. We've got a heck of a lot to cover, so without further ado, I'm going to crack straight on. Researchers at the University of Florida found that people would rather be blind, deaf, or lose a limb than obese. And yet one quarter of us heading towards one third are obese and two thirds overweight. That doesn't make sense. To not be obese, to be this thing that we want more than our sight, our hearing, our mobility, we are told that we just need to eat less and or do more. You'll be very familiar with that platitude. Quite specifically, we're told that to lose one pound of fat, we just need to create a deficit of three and a half thousand calories. So let's start looking at some of the evidence. This is going to fall into five parts. Part one, we're going to look at conventional wisdom. Part two, we're going to look at the obesity epidemic. I'm not going to dwell on the problems that it causes, but just take you through the statistics and when it started. The million-dollar question that's going to come just after halfway through, how do we lose weight? And it's not eat less, do more. I'll give that away at this stage. The current diet advice, how do we stop the obesity epidemic and pulling it all together? So straight into conventional wisdom. As I said in the introduction, conventional wisdom says that we just need to eat less, do more, and quite specifically, it's become known as the calorie formula. To lose a pound of fat, we need to create this deficit of 3,500 calories. So let's look at each of these in turn. Now, to look at the general principle, when people say we need to eat less and do more, when you ask them why do you say that, they will say because energy in equals energy out and therefore you need to put less energy in and get more energy out. And then when you probe further and say, well, where do you get that energy in equals energy out from? They'll say it's the laws of the universe. Sometimes they seem tempted to say silly at the end of the sentence, as if it should be so very obvious. But the laws of thermodynamics do not say energy in equals energy out. Now, it's important to give a bit of context at this stage in terms of the laws of thermodynamics. How did they come about? Now, some of you will be aware in the 1800s, industrialists at the start of the Industrial Revolution were trying to see if the perfectly efficient machine could be made. Could we put 100 units of energy into a machine and get 100 units of energy out of that machine? They quite quickly realized that there was no such thing as the perfect machine. And the first law of thermodynamics was their first discovery. It's the law of conservation in a closed system in thermal equilibrium, energy can neither be created nor destroyed, it shall be conserved. Well, the human body is not a closed system. It is not in thermal equilibrium, although it is continually trying to get there. And then the laws of thermodynamics said that's okay, that's what we observed with the steam engines that we were trying to put coal into, which is why we came up with the second law. And this is universally ignored in the world of dieting. There are perhaps a handful of people who have addressed this second law. And the second law is called entropy. It's also called the law of common sense. And it basically says that energy will be lost. And energy will be used up in making that energy available. And we need to take both of those into account. Now, for completeness, you've got the final law, which sets the parameters of the system. And then at the very end, they realized they'd actually made an implicit assumption about thermal equilibrium, because thermodynamics, the word thermo meaning heat, dynamics meaning movement, they'd implicitly assumed something about the transference of heat, so they added that in. But those are the laws of thermodynamics. None of them say energy in equals energy out. So the misapplications, that's the first one. <clears throat> the second one, therefore, is that we have to accept at this early stage that a calorie is not a calorie. As a tautology, of course it is. But as anything, once it goes into the human body, it is not the same thing. There's actually a brilliant paper in 2004 by Fine and Feynman, and they actually entitled their paper, If a Calorie Were a Calorie, it would violate the second law of thermodynamics. Remember that second law that says energy will be used up in making available energy. 
This work was then taken by a Swiss scientist called Jequier in 2002 and built upon by Fine and Feynman in 2004. Jequier did the basic work to say, okay, there are three macronutrients. The dietitians, nutritionists on familiar ground now, carbs, fats, proteins for everyone else. Those are the three macronutrients, but the body handles them in very different ways. And Jequier showed that thermogenesis, the thermic effect of nutrients, the, the energy that the body has to use in turning those nutrients into something as useful energy in the body, our ATP currency, is different for different macronutrients. And for protein, he estimated that it was at about 70 to 75 percent. And for carbohydrates, it's at about 93 to 94. So put this in terminology that we can understand. I can eat 100 calories of pure carbohydrate. Let's call it sugar and I can eat 100 calories of, let's get as close to protein as we can, egg white. And about 72 will be available to my body from the egg white, and about 93 will be available from the sugar. That's one heck of a metabolic advantage. That starts to explain why low-carb diets do so well. There's no direction of causation in the laws of thermodynamics. It's not crucial to this presentation, but it's an interesting one to, to throw in. We say, that this is what um, Gary Tobes calls the fat and lazy theory. Um, you know, we, we assume when people are eating too much or doing too little, eating too much, they're fat, doing too little, they're lazy. Um, but there's no direction of causation. They could just as easily be running up the stairs because they're slim and they're able to than they're slim because they were running up the stairs. Do you see the difference in that terminology? So just, just one to lob in. <clears throat> Very important one here. Energy in and energy out are dependent, not independent variables. When we say we can put less energy in and get more energy out, that's the last thing that the body wants to do. The minute we put less energy in, the body wants us to put more energy in and to do less. So try to eat less, the body tries to get you to eat more and do less. It just works against you the whole time. And we flit, this is an absolute critical one, we flit between weight and energy as if they are interchangeable. The laws of thermodynamics are about energy. They say absolutely nothing about weight. Think about a power station. We put hundreds of thousands of tons of coal into that power station and out comes weightless electricity. Energy may have been conserved, the caveat of the second law allowed, but weight is in no way conserved. Which brings us nicely on to the calorie formula because this is our conversion between weight and energy. Now, this is the British Dietetic Association definition many people will be very familiar with. A pound of fat contains 3,500 calories. So to lose a pound a week, you need a deficit of 500 calories a day. That would be 500 times 7, 3,500. Three problems of this. The first one is that one pound does not equal 3,500 calories, not anywhere close. A deficit of 3,500 calories will not lead to a loss of one pound of fat. Never has, never will. And the body can and does adjust. This idea that you can just put less in and the body will just give up fat as if it's some kind of cash machine for fat is quite possibly the most naive assumption we have made in the world of dieting. So let's look at this one pound equals three and a half thousand calories. Not many people actually know how to get to a number even close to three and a half thousand. So I had to work this out to all intents and purposes. One pound does equal 454 grams. One gram of fat equals nine calories is an assumption. We'll come on to that. Adipose tissue, human fat tissue, approximately 87% lipid. Again, that is a range. It's not an actual fact. If you apply all of those together, multiply all of those numbers, you come to the conclusion that one pound equals 3555 calories. That's close enough, you might think, until you see the ludicrous way in which we lose, use this formula. Any women who've ever picked up a women's magazine, they'll tell you stupid things like the National Obesity Forum quote there at the bottom of the page. Um, one fewer, it should be, 50 calorie plain biscuit per day, 
and you will lose five pounds. It's just a three and a half thousand calorie times table. You just take the number of days times that deficit, but the formula is nowhere near that accurate. And here's the range that we've got to play with. These numbers down at the bottom here, these numbers for estimating the calorie content of a gram of fat, a gram of protein, and a gram of carbohydrate were done by Walter and, um, sorry, Atwater and Rubner in 1901. So they've been with us for more than 110 years. Their original estimates were that carbohydrates approximated to 4.1 calories, protein 4.1, fat 9.3. They had a number of fats coming in at 9.5. I think olive oil was at 9.5. This is a pretty wide range. And um, Livesey has done some work. He's actually gone on to do some work with Weight Watchers because they have actually finally realized this and adopted some of this. And he said that a gram of fat is much nearer 8.7 calories. Adipose tissue, the, the statistics that we got for human fat tissue being approximately 87% lipid came from the, two, uh, the 1911 Bosenrad article. And in that same article, the range given was 72 to 87% lipid. So that's one heck of a range. So what happens when we take the lower end? So we take the 8.7, we take the 72 um, percent lipid and we can come up with one pound equals 2,800 calories. Take the upper end and that 3752 is actually the exact number that Wisniewski was working to in 1959. So over 50 years ago we knew that there was a big discrepancy here. Now this number in yellow, incredibly, this is how inaccurate this science is. This is the number of pounds that you would gain in a year if one pound equals 2,800 calories and not three and a half thousand, because you would think you could be in equilibrium at a much higher number than you can in fact be in equilibrium. That's the number of pounds that we would lose if in fact one pound equals 3,700 calories. So next time you see the magazine and the men's health are the worst for it, saying, you know, 20 calories a day and you're gonna have lost two pounds of love handles by the end of the year, guys, you're not even in the ballpark. So where does this formula come from? This absolutely fascinated me. If I don't know where something comes from, just ask. Um, but nobody has been able to give me an answer to this question yet. Now, I saw a, a BBC programme, actually, um, the people who went back in time and, and ate from different eras, um, and they actually looked at America in the 19... Um, just before the 20s, and there's a book there, Lulu Hunt Peters' Diet and Health, and Lulu sets out, effectively, the calorie formula in her 1918 book, but there is no evidence for it. There is no backup, there's no rationale, there's no, this is where I got it from. And what she's saying here, this is the formula applied absolutely directly. Cut out this 1,000 calories a day and you will lose 96 pounds over the year. And it's actually 104, to be precise, if you do the maths accurately. What this means, just to get the absurdity, I weigh 110 pounds. So I'm supposed to cut back by 1,000 calories a day and I'm six pounds in a year's time. Now you should chuckle at that point, but it's the formula that is in every government document, every diet book, every piece of literature, every nutrition and dietetics course, countrywide, and it's not just the UK, it's Australia, New Zealand, and America. And we know not from whence it came. So I asked the leading seven organizations in June 2009, British Dietetic Association, NICE, our Institute for Clinical Excellence, where does this formula come from? And none of them knew. To give you an example of the kind of replies I got, this is the Department of Health. We're unaware of the rationale behind the weight loss formula you refer to. I don't refer to it. It's in your documentation, not mine, but you don't know where it comes from. And NICE, the evidence-based body, while our documents are supposed to be evidence-based, we don't have any evidence for this one. Now, two try to prove it, because the second part of the question was, can you prove it? Can you show me one example? That's all I'm asking for, one example where that formula is held, because it should hold every time, but I'll make it easy, just once. <coughs> Dietitians um, working as the Dietetics and Obesity Management and the Association for the Study of Obesity tried, and they actually came up with one study. It's in the NICE document, Management of Obesity. One study involving 12 people had a 600 calorie a day deficit for one year. Do the formula. They should have been 62 and a half pounds of fat lighter. Fat. That's how much fat you're supposed to lose. There's more in top on t in terms of fat and water and muscle. They were, in fact, on average, 11 pounds lighter. 
and the range was 0.8 to 17.2. Now, we have 1.5 billion overweight people in the world, and the seven leading organizations in the UK cannot prove their formula in a study of 12 people, not by a margin. So they have known that since 2009. Why has that not been removed from all the literature? Why did Dame Professor Sally Davis, Chief Medical Officer for England last October, come out and say England just needs to eat five billion fewer calories, 100 calories per day per 50 million citizens of England, because she believes that formula and she knows not where it comes from. And does it hold? Has it ever held? Well, the first study that we believe was ever done on calorie deficit diets was Benedict, 1917, took 12 men, tried to reduce their weight by about 10% over the period of a month, managed, tried to maintain it for two months, and then let them go th free. Guess what? They regained all the weight plus about eight pounds. Keyes repeated that experiment. Minnesota starvation experiment, one of the most brilliant experiments ever done. Repeated it with 36 conscientious objectors, over a 24-week period, he tried to get their weight to basically follow some kind of formula. Um, it followed nowhere near the formula he was expecting. At about 20 weeks, this is an interesting point, the men started to plateau and some started to regain. He'd started them off on about 1,600 calories a day, which by modern diet terminology is not um, too harsh. And he was having to cut them down to below 1,000 and still they weren't losing. When the men were eventually allowed to go free range, they ate until they could eat no more. 11, 12,000 calories a day were reported. They regained all the weight, plus about 10%. When I've worked with people in obesity and they come into me, one of the most common things that people say is, I wasn't overweight until I went on my first diet, maybe just a little bit, but I lost weight, I regained it and more. I lost weight, I regained it and more. We are making people fatter and sicker with this advice that we're giving. Stankard and McLaren-Hume, 1959, actually quantified it. This is where I think the 98% of diets fail comes from, because they did their own study, they looked at all the literature from the 20th century and said two years later, only 2% of patients had maintained a modest weight loss. 20 pounds was considered modest with the size of the patients that they were working with. <clears throat> and France, effectively repeated the McLaren-Hume study in 2007. We'll have a look at this now. I absolutely love this graph. 26,000 people, 80 studies, and they're all calorie deficit studies. So you've got things from the yellow line, exercise alone, diet and exercise in green. All of these slides are going to be available so you can look at them to your heart's content. Don't be fooled by this one. This was actually cybutramine, a weight loss drug which was withdrawn because of cardiac concerns. By the time that this happened, this was actually the only study still going. So the path should have been much more like this pale blue one, the very low calorie diets. But look at that magic sort of 20 week, 24 week. Look at what's happening at about six months. I first saw this at a meeting of the National Obesity Forum for Wales, presented by Professor Nick Finer. And he said, basically all we're doing is delaying the time that people break through the line. So all these people put in all this massive effort into starving themselves and killing themselves down the gym, and we're merely delaying them from breaking through the line that they would have broken through anyway. <clears throat> this is where the calorie formula says we should be. So at this six-month period, we should be down 52 pounds. At the 12-month period, we should be down 104 pounds. You can see what I'm doing here. I've had to squash all those lovely colored lines up there to show where we actually should be at four years instead of the actual three to six kilograms down. And that's for the people who actually stayed on the diet. You can imagine how many fell by the wayside, which is why they were only able to follow, I mean, to follow 26,000 through to the end is pretty good going. That is the gap. That there is the gap between reality and what we're telling people they will lose if they cut back by three and a half thousand calories a day. And this is the key reason why, because when we tell people to eat less, and then we tell them to do more, we think that the body is just going to give up fat. Let's take a typical woman, unfortunately this probably is a typical woman in today's world, basal metabolic rate, the calories that you need just lying in bed all day approximate to 1500, and let's say she's doing exercise about three times a week, so her, her BMR plus, the calories over and above that, are probably only aware of about 500. People who are familiar with the Harris-Benedict equation will realize it really is that small. 
So the calorie theory says cut by 700, that's those two added together, over 3,500, you're just going to lose a fifth of a pound of fat. Every time you do that, fifth of a pound of fat is just going to magically disappear. But the body can and does adjust. Now you put less in, the body says, do you know what I was going to do? Building bone density, fighting infection, cell repair, not going to do that today because you didn't put the fuel in. And actually I was going to walk the dog and do some ironing, maybe a bit of gardening, I'm not going to do that either. So you just robbed from what your body was going to do. How many people would be quite so keen to go down the gym if they just thought they'd robbed from what their body was going to do anyway? Or they robbed from walking the dog that evening? The body adjusts, always has, always will. Right, we're on to part two now, the obesity epidemic. <clears throat> These stats, I know it sort of blows us away when we talk about this epidemic, but they really are incredible. Those are the World Health Organization statistics for the UK. You can extrapolate back as long as you want, three and a half million years if you like, we didn't have an obesity problem. We didn't really have an obesity problem. In 1972, 2.7% of females overweight, the same number for men. Not even 30 years later, a quarter obese, 25.8% of women. That's a tenfold increase in obesity in fewer than three decades. That is quite staggering. And exactly the same happened in the US. They were slightly ahead of us, and we'll see why in a second, but their obesity rates just took off. It's this obesity line here that's driving this total. I mean, it's almost like an aeroplane taking off at about 1976 to 1980. So you have to ask the question, what happened at that time? Well, what happened is we changed our diet advice. Um, this document is the very document, the coma report referred to at the bottom here, the diet and cardiovascular disease policy, we changed our diet advice. America went first, 1977, they changed their diet advice. Then they put in place these dietary guidelines for Americans, which have come in every five years since 1980. 1983, we floated some ideas, and then we put them into practice in 1984. So what change did we make? Well, I love this quote at the top. It's from Tanner's Practice in Medicine from 1869. It was known as the gospel in terms of what weight was all about, certainly for over 100 years. Farinaceous and vegetable, interesting, foods are fattening and saccharine matters especially so. That's flowery and sugary foods. Wait till you see what we're eating at the moment. We changed that too, and this very paragraph comes from this document. We used to think that carbs made us fat. Your granny will still think that carbs make you fat, but we're now much more concerned about fat. So we want you to restrict your fat intake to 30% of total energy and your saturated fat intake to 10%. No rationale given. No, these are the millions of studies that have been done and this is why you would need to reduce your saturated fat intake. And I had the Food Standards Agency, I've got a letter from them when I said, why, why did you do this? You know, did you know that carbs were great? Did you know that fat was bad? No, but we thought that fat was bad and people have to eat something. So to replace fat, there's nothing really other than carbohydrate because the protein content in the diet needs to stay pretty stable. Too much, too little is not good. Why did we change our diet advice? This is obviously the really, really important question. And it was all about heart disease. And America in the 1950s was starting to think heart disease was getting to be a bit troubling. That's actually quite interesting because the first heart attack was actually only recorded or heart disease was only recorded in 1948. So even by the 50s, they're thinking, whoa, we've got a bit of a problem here. This is actually Ansel Keys. This is the guy who did the brilliant Minnesota experiment. He just published it in 1950. He was the man of the moment. He wanted to stay the man of the moment. He recalled that a Russian pathologist called Anti Chowskow had done a study on rabbits in 1913, and he had fed them purified cholesterol. And he'd managed to get their cholesterol levels about five times what you would normally see in a human. Now, the obvious flaw in this experiment, if we've got any vegetarians in the audience, is that rabbits are herbivores. They don't eat animal foods. Cholesterol is only found in animal foods, no exceptions. So he's put the wrong thing into these poor rabbits. It's not really surprising that any part of them clogged up. As it happens, what isn't widely reported is that the bunnies didn't go on to develop heart disease. And studies done on dogs, in parallel, because dogs will eat anything, they didn't have any problems at all. But Keyes remembered this, and he said, I think cholesterol 
is the culprit in heart disease. So he spent the 1950s, and I've got all the studies if you want, you know, the dozens of them that he did, the complete references. He spent the 1950s trying to show that cholesterol in food impacted cholesterol in the blood, and he failed, and he admitted this. And he said there's no connection whatsoever between cholesterol in food and cholesterol in the blood, and we've known that all along. Unless you're a rabbit, and they obviously did the same experiment with chickens, then it's a different story, but for humans, there absolutely is no connection. But how many people know that today? How many people are still avoiding eggs or liver because of a supposed cholesterol content when there is nothing in those foods that can have any impact on your blood cholesterol level whatsoever? Now, here's where the logic went badly, badly wrong. And if only he and I had been able to have a coffee or something at the time, because this just doesn't make sense. Only animal foods contain cholesterol. Meat, fish, eggs, dairy, the only foods that contain cholesterol. To get his human guinea pigs to test for him a massive increase in cholesterol in their diet, he had to feed them animal foods. So he has exonerated animal foods. Can you see that? He's exonerated cholesterol, he's exonerated animal foods. Why then would he go after any other substance in animal foods? Because he's exonerated animal foods as the whole set. But he didn't. He said, no, it's got to be fat. And quite particularly, it's got to be saturated fat. But all animal foods contain saturated fat. And if cholesterol's got no impact, then animals have got no impact. But he didn't go that route. He did something called the Seven Country Study. Ran between 1956 and 1970, involved almost 13,000 men. Seven hand-picked countries. He's had a lot of flack for the countries that he picked. Um, all those cohorts, and the only conclusions that he came to, again, I've read every word of the 20 volumes of this study, people think that study proves that saturated fat causes heart disease. It doesn't even claim to prove that. He said at the end of all of this, I think that coronary heart disease tends to be related to cholesterol. I think cholesterol tends to be related to saturated fat. It would. They're in the same foods. And therefore, I think they're all sort of related together. Well, they probably are if they're in the same foods. But you've gone after the wrong thing. Now, 25 years later, he didn't actually quantify any evidence that he thought he had for fat and cholesterol until 25 years after the study was published. And he said, if we look at the cholesterol levels of the guys at the beginning of the study and then look at who went on to die in that 14-year period, I can come up with a correlation, a relationship of 0.72 between cholesterol at the start and death during the period. I ran his numbers just to check what statistical method he'd used. He's used the Pearson correlation. And I happened to notice that there was a pattern depending on the cohort's location versus the equator, so latitude. So I re-ran the numbers versus latitude. You get a 0.96 correlation for heart deaths and latitude. He didn't need to do all those, posts, those blood tests across all those postcodes over 14 years or whatever. He just needed to ask the guys at the beginning, where are you on the latitude scale? And he could have predicted their heart disease with virtual perfect guarantee. Now, does that make any sense? Absolutely, it makes sense. Because how is vitamin D made? Sun shines on the body, synthesizes cholesterol in the skin, turns it into vitamin D. So the people further away from the equator have higher cholesterol levels, but they have lower vitamin D as a consequence. The Mediterranean's higher vitamin D, lower cholesterol. The lower cholesterol is not a baddie in any way, shape, or form. It's a symptom. The real problem is the low vitamin D. What are we observing at the moment in Scotland? Return of rickets, heart disease in Scotland, vitamin D in Scotland, we know to be atrocious. We have had 50 years of macronutrient confusion. Now, here is where I hope we can get a really heated agreement. Because the foods that Keyes was looking at, and when you read the 20 volumes of this study, this was not a dietary study in any way, shape, or form. There is barely a mention of any specific foods in most parts of the study. But where you do see a mention of the foods, you'll see things like cakes and ice cream, which, of course, are processed carbohydrates, meat, pork, poultry, eggs which, of course, nutritional experts in the audience will know are mostly unsaturated fat. Not that one's better or worse than any other, but they're mostly unsaturated fat. Milk and butter. 
You wouldn't think we would still make that mistake today, but go on the Food Standards Agency website, the National Health Service website, that's the list of saturated fats. Biscuits, cakes, chocolate, confectionery, ice cream, pastries, pies, savoury snacks. Demonise all of those, please. Let me lead the campaign to ban them, tax them, whatever you want to do. They should not be going in human bodies, but they are not saturated fats. You've got the meat and the lard. Lard, mostly unsaturated fat, particularly like that one. So demonise those carbohydrates, get the facts right about the green stuff, and then we've got to understand the consequences of demonising dairy products. Because, five facts about fat. Number one, it is utterly life vital, as is cholesterol. Die instantly without fat. Interestingly, there are essential fats, things we must eat that contain fat. There are essential proteins, things that we must eat to get protein. There is no essential carbohydrate. All of us in this audience could not eat another gram of carbohydrate between now and the day we die, and nothing untoward would happen to us. It would seriously affect us if we gave up fat and protein. There are three fats, saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated. Any food that contains any fat contains all those three fats. There are absolutely no exceptions. So you cannot eat saturated fat. People saying, cut back on saturated fat and eat more unsaturated fat. How? There isn't a single product on this planet that doesn't have all of those in together. You know, why don't we explain that to people? Only dairy products have got more saturated than unsaturated fat. Again, not that one's better or worse than any other, but just to put it on the record. Fat can't make us fat. If you look at our saturated fat intake between those two dates when our obesity increased tenfold, our saturated fat intake per person per day almost halved. And this is the most serious one to me. The UK is seriously deficient in fat-soluble vitamins, which are only found in foods with fats. Vitamin A, about a half. Vitamin D, the really serious one, about a quarter. Vitamin E, our body's natural antioxidant, two-thirds. K, they don't even bother measuring. This is the government's own data from those food surveys. Goes back as far as 1940. Any of you can look at it. I would look at that data if I were the government and say we need to issue an urgent directive for the population to eat more fat, to get those fat-soluble vitamins. What do they do? Demonize fat even further. Where is fat found? What we've got here is the graph, and I'm not going to spend much time on this, um, but we've got going up in order here from the grams of fat, this is all per 100 grams of product, down to the bottom. So you've got things like lard and olive oil that are 100% fat, no protein, carb, water whatsoever. Here's pork, one of our lovely red meats, um, mostly monounsaturated fat because, of course, meat is. Um, pita bread has got slightly more fat. Oats have got almost double. Sirloin steak. You know, we tell people to eat loads of olive oil and avoid red meat. Well, olive oil's got nine times the saturated fat of red meat. And then we say oily fish, but don't eat red meat. Well, mackerel has got 150% of the saturated fat and double the overall fat of sirloin steak. So why are we not telling people to eat the things that actually have got the essential fats that we need? I mean, sunflower seeds, yes, incredibly high in fat, but I mean all essential fats, and it's virtually impossible to get vitamin E if we don't eat some of those things. This may interest people as well, because people think that the study has been done. We talk so confidently about the fact that saturated fat is bad for us, cholesterol is bad for us. You think that the study has been done. This 1984 Coma report actually says there has been no clinical trial of the effect of decreasing saturated fatty acids on coronary heart disease, nor is it likely that such a trial will be undertaken. The Trustwell report, which is the one that the UK government most relies on because it's analysis of all the other bits of data, I've gone through every single one of the original studies included in this report, Trustwell also said the study hasn't been done and likely never will be. And the Food Standards Agency repeated the same to me in 2009. You know now why the study can't be done. Because you cannot change saturated fat in the diet without changing something else at the same time. The minute you swap one food for another, even if you swap one oil for another so you don't affect any other macronutrient, you affect micronutrients. You affect the composition of fat, as we saw in the last slide. The trial will never be done because it can never be done. So we have to start using some common sense. And this is when it gets serious for me, because I did some original research about a year ago. 
And I want you to understand, you know, all this stuff we're being told about cholesterol and, and death is pretty serious. I don't want to die. I want to get the original facts, and I want to find out what the statistics say. So, again, anyone, I've got the references on there. I can give you the original spreadsheet. Go to the World Health Organization. Fantastic data. Get the data and download it for 192 countries in the world. You've got here men <clears throat> and heart deaths. And you've got cardiovascular deaths per 100,000 of population and the mean cholesterol level of each country. So you've got 192 dots there by country. You see a slight trend line down, an inverse relationship between high deaths and low cholesterol and low deaths and high cholesterol. Very small, that's the R squared, not the R, very small, but it's a downwards line. So then take females and heart deaths, and it starts getting much more obviously stronger and much stronger on the R squared. Take it then to all deaths, and it gets stronger still. That's men and all deaths. Women and all deaths, an R squared of 0.5, that's an R of about 0.8. I mean, that gets incredibly serious. All 192 countries in the world, the higher your cholesterol, sorry, yeah, the higher your cholesterol level, the lower your chance of dying, and the lower your cholesterol, the higher your chance of dying. It's the exact opposite of what we've been told. Of course, it makes sense because fat and cholesterol are the main repair, protective tools that the body has. Cholesterol is so utterly vital in the human body. We just can't reproduce function, you know, remove cholesterol from a human body, you've got a puddle on the floor. It is that vital. Here's interesting, and here's where we might go back to that heated agreement, because remember, we've been demonizing the wrong macronutrient. We've been calling all those horrible things, cakes, biscuits, pastries, pies, confectionery, saturated fats, when they're not, they are processed carbohydrates. Here's something that can unnaturally raise cholesterol. The body makes cholesterol, by the way. It's making it right now. If you're pregnant, it will make more because you've got to make a healthy baby. If you have an operation, it will make more because it needs to repair you. It's a fantastic, wonderful thing in your body. So notwithstanding that your body's making it, when might your body make it in an unnatural way? Well, the starting process by which the body makes cholesterol, this is just the cholesterol synthesis pathway, is a substance called acetyl-CoA. Happen to notice if you go over here to the Krebs cycle, acetyl CoA is one of the early byproducts of the Krebs cycle. What's the Krebs cycle, of course? Put carbohydrates in the body. It's how the body turns carbohydrates into ATP, the body's energy currency. So, in telling people to avoid fat, when in fact we were talking about carbohydrates all along, those cakes and pastries, we've inadvertently got people eating more carbohydrates. And those are the things that can unnaturally raise cholesterol. Three questions I've got at this stage before we move on to the next bit. Do you think that Mother Nature is trying to kill you? Because I really do think that that's what this boils down to. If we've been eating red meat and any animal that we could lay our hands on since Australopithecus Lucy first walked upright about three and a half million years ago, do you think that we would have survived this far if all the vitamins and all the minerals are in those same foods as a substance that is allegedly trying to kill us? Given that my body is making cholesterol right this second, it will make lots more tonight over the night. Do I think my body is trying to kill me? No, I don't. Come to your own conclusion, but I don't. But I will throw this one in at you. If your answer to one or two is yes, do you know what paranoia is? Right, how do we lose weight? This is what people want to know. This is what fat looks like. If any of you can actually pinch anything on you at the moment, what you are pinching, human fat tissue, is something called triglyceride. And it's basically three fats joined together on a backbone of glycerol. And we've got over here um, something many of you will be familiar with, the pancreas, and what happens when we have sugar in the body. Now, we've got basically, imagine these little fat cells, you've got them all around the body, let's say they're just cycling in and out across cell membranes, they can get across as individual fatty acids. They can't get locked in to this fat area until they have this glycerol bit to join them together. Where does glycerol come from? Glucose. Where does glucose come from? Carbohydrate. So how do we make fat? How do we store fat? How do we get fat? We eat carbohydrates. Now, insulin does it here. When the pancreas detects that there's sugar in the blood, anything above a healthy level, the pancreas will say, off you go, insulin, turn that glucose into glycogen, store it in the liver, store it in the, models, in, in the muscles, but get it out of the bloodstream because it's toxic. So get it out rapidly. When the body detects 
that there's actually no glucose around, maybe the person's gone on a low-carb diet, then the pancreas will send glucagon out to say, liver, go and start breaking me down some of these structures, because I need some fats, I'm just about to go for a walk. The brain needs some glycerol. And people will tell you that the, the brain needs glucose, and it absolutely does, but that doesn't mean that we need to eat glucose. And particularly if we're overweight, we don't want to be eating glucose. We want our body to be doing exactly that, breaking down this fat structure to release the glycerol for the brain and the fats at the same time. This blew me away when I found it. <clears throat> the amount of sugar that we are able to have in the bloodstream before the pancreas calls upon insulin to do its job is about one teaspoon. We need between 0.8 and 1.1 grams of glucose per litre of blood. Average human is about five litres, so that's about four to 5.5 grams of glucose. Go back to that assumption, albeit an approximation, four calories per gram of carbohydrate, glucose approximates to carbohydrates, that's about 16 to 22 calories is our normal blood sugar range for glucose. And anything beyond that, and insulin has to get it out of the bloodstream, store it as glycogen within a 24-hour period. If we've not used it because we have this demand for glucose and glucagon goes to break it down, it then gets stored as fat. So eat carbs, store fat. Now, I might get a squeal at this next slide, but it's because of this sugar that I have to say this is the modern, what I believe, cause of the obesity epidemic. It's called the Eat Well Plate. It's put up as our role model of healthy eating in the UK. I have to call it the Eat Badly Plate in the context of that sugar that I have just shown you. Because this is essentially sugar. We tell people here, don't eat too much sucrose. What is sucrose? A molecule of glucose and a molecule of fructose. We then say have 33% of your plate in the form of fructose glucose and 33% of your plate in the form of glucose fructose. Now, only thing here that comes out of the ground or grazes in a field is these potatoes here. The rest of this is processed food. I mean, have anyone really looked at this closely and seen that we've got cornflakes, probably about 25% sugar, white bread, white bagels, Battenberg cake, chocolate, sweets, cola, sponge cake, sugary baked beans, coloured yoghurt, doesn't need to be coloured, the tins of fruit have undoubtedly got syrup in as well. There are, if I show the red circles there, there are about three foods on this whole plate that have no impact on blood glucose levels, that don't contain glucose, fructose, or lactose. That is obviously mostly going to contain lactose, but some sucrose in there. That is just pure glucose. That is pretty much pure glucose with fructose, uh, sorry, fructose with glucose in the starchy veg. And it's only, uh, there's a bit of fish here, there's some meat here, I've excluded this meat because it's breaded, and there's some oil here. That's basically the only thing that is not going to impact our blood glucose levels. And we have not only an epidemic of obesity, but an epidemic of illness related to glucose, I put it to you. Cancer, Otto Warburg. But for cancer, there is one prime cause, the oxidization of sugar in the body. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Study the works of um, Lustig and Johnson. Fructose is the main culprit in that area. Fructose is not this halo sugar that we've made out to be. High fructose corn syrup has come in on the back of that halo effect. Fruit goes straight to the liver to be metabolized. Least glucose has got half a chance of going into the bloodstream. If somebody's doing a bit of activity, it might get used up, but fructose is going straight to the liver. Now, when we're telling Mrs. Jones to give her little lad five a day, fruit's much more palatable than veg for the little children. We're not only making her little boy fat, we're actually making his liver fat at the same time. Fructose, really, you have to research a lot more and, as I say, follow the work of Lustig and Johnson because it's quite scary. Coronary heart disease, I mean, what is a more likely cause of damage to the endothelial wall, the lining of the arteries? Is it the animals that we've been eating for three and a half million years or is it the sugar whose consumption has increased 20-fold in the blink of an eye? in terms of evolution. Diabetes, what is type two diabetes if not an inability to handle glucose? You know, the typical day that we're advising people to eat, have cereal for breakfast. How many teaspoons of sugar in that cereal? 
that completely take the blood glucose level out of the normal range. Pancreas wakes up, then you have a piece of fruit mid-morning, then you have a sandwich, bag of crisps, meal dill, you have a muffin in the afternoon, you have pasta or pizza, the starchy foods that we're telling people to base their meals on in the evening. I think type 2 diabetes is the body literally getting to the point where it says enough's enough. I used to get berries maybe twice a year if I was lucky. I'm now getting 20 teaspoons of sugar every single day. I can't cope. And we're now seeing type 2 diabetes in children. And Julian Hamilton Shield in Bristol will say if he sees a teenage type 2 diabetic, they're going to be lucky to make it to age 40. Are we really giving good advice, telling people to base their meals on glucose, starchy foods? This is what we end up eating as a result of that plate. Again, you can analyze the government information. I can show you my original data. 1,536 processed food calories a day. Staggeringly, 1.4 kilograms of flour per person per week. 731 grams of sugar per person per week. And I've tried to draw these in area ratios. So this is about a 20th of that one. That's about a half of that one. 39 grams of butter per person per week. And we have the absurdity to say we need to eat less butter. I don't think it's the butter making us fat. And what has gone down during the time that obesity has gone up tenfold? Because these can't be the culprits. The things that have gone down can't have been making us fat. Real meat, eggs, butter, whole milk, and fresh vegetables. What has gone up, processed vegetables, processed potatoes, all these oven chips, cereals, cereal products, confectionery ice cream, the starchy foods that we've been telling people to eat. They've listened to us. They've done what they were told. And who's behind our diet advice? <clears throat> These are the organizations behind the American Dietetic Association. I've circled Pepsi because Pepsi is the single biggest food and drink company in the world. They also own Walkers and Frito-Lay and snack sauces and all kinds of things. They're worth about $44 billion. If you put them in a list of countries in the world, they come in at number 60. They're bigger than about 130 countries of the world. This isn't about Libya and Egypt and Afghanistan anymore. This is about corporations like Walmart and Pepsi being the size of small countries. That's what we're up against. And they make sure they are behind the people giving dietary advice to our citizens. That's $467 billion of revenue between that lot. The Dietitians Association of Australia, no different. British Nutrition Foundation, you struggled to get them all on one slide on this one. This one is really quite special. And even our obesity organisations. We have no one, not one single independent obesity organisation trying to do something about this obesity epidemic. They're sponsored by diet companies, Kellogg's, Coca-Cola, Mars, Change for Life, the latest programme. Go and look at their partners. It's a who's who of the food, grocery and drink industry. And that's why we're making no progress with obesity. That's why Andrew Lansley in England has actually abandoned the talks that they were holding at Unilever House with Unilever in the chair, because if you don't eat butter, you eat those hideous spreads that those guys make, and that's why we're not getting anywhere. So we're on to part four now. How do we stop the obesity epidemic? What do we as individuals need to do? Number one, eat food. Shouldn't need to call it real food. I want them to have to call theirs fake food and then we can own calling ours real food. Three times a day, I do say unless you are a cow or you want to be the size of a cow, please stop grazing. We cannot eat little and often. We cannot drip feed glucose all day long. Now you know that you can only lose weight in the absence of glucose and you can only gain weight in the presence of glucose. Why would you want to drip feed glucose? all day long, and manage your carbohydrate intake. The first two rules there will get you 90% of the way there. If you're not where you want to be, shunning all processed food, and I mean all processed food, and eating proper, very good sized meals three times a day, then manage your carbohydrate intake, because it can only be the carbohydrate that provides the glycerol for you to be able to store human fat tissue. Now that then begs the question, okay, eat food, and you might have heard the famous Michael Pollan expression, eat food, good start, mostly plants, not too much. I would say eat food, mostly animals, quite a lot. And I was a vegetarian for 20 years, so you can't imagine how hard it is for me to say that, but I'll tell you why I say it. 
Because if you go and look at micronutrients, we've only talked about macronutrients up until now, there are 13 um, vitamins and approximately 16 minerals that we absolutely must ingest in some way. If we don't, we die, or our sight disappears, or our bone density disappears, or something else fairly hideous happens. These are not optional extras that we can chuck in with a vitamin pill. And when you look at real food, and any of you can do this, fantastic website, nutritiondata.com, it's the United States Department of Agriculture entire food database online for the whole world to use. Just go in and put in some basic foods and look at, this is just the vitamins chart. And Granny was right. Liver is absolutely unbeatable. Sardines, incredibly useful for vitamin D. The point I stopped being a vegetarian was when I realized I needed to eat 26 eggs every single day to get 10 micrograms of uh, vitamin D or a small tin of sardines. And at the point that you realize it's their health or yours, you've got to make a choice, and I did. Now, broccoli is good for vitamin C. Um, apples, fruit, I mean, hopefully people in the audience know that there is no substance behind five a day. That was invented by the fruit and veg companies in 1991 to help sell more fruit and vegetables. Certainly no evidence base behind it. And when you look at fruit, there's no justification for telling people to eat fruit or um, orange juice or whatever. Take any fruit. The only one that will actually do quite well is avocado because that's the one with fat. Okay, pick any non-fat fruit and try and line it up against any animal food and you just can't get anywhere. I've put in sucrose just because it is that thing that we're eating 400 calories of per person per day and it has no nutrients whatsoever. It's the only thing we ingest that has no nutrition whatsoever. Even water has got calcium, potassium, magnesium. Sugar is completely useless, empty calories. Want to solve the obesity epidemic in one stroke? Eliminate sugar from the world. And then we have no obesity, no food addiction, no withdrawal. Flour I've put in because this is the starchy foods that we're telling people to base their meals on. Hasn't got a look in anywhere on the vitamins. It comes in as okay on manganese. But for any dark chocolate lovers, that's the value for cocoa powder. So I'd rather get my manganese in very, very dark chocolate than in flour or pizza or pasta that's going to make me fat. And then look at the oily fish that starts coming in on the minerals, liver again on some really critical ones. Red meat, so important for zinc, which the UK is probably also deficient in. And yet, what are we demonizing? Red meat, anything with fat in, the things with fats are also the things with all the vitamins and minerals. Again, do you think nature's trying to kill us? Or do you think she put all the good things in all of those foods? So what would I like public health advisors to do? Take down that eat badly plate. We cannot solve this obesity epidemic if we carry on telling people to base their meals on glucose, starchy foods. Stop telling people to base their meals on those fattening foods and have one public health message, eat real food. The school's food trust came out about two weeks ago with a guideline on eating for toddlers, under fives. It was 80 pages long. We could have done it in two words, eat food. You know, infants don't need any more than that. They don't need the three times a day, manage your carbs. They just need the eat food bit and everything else falls into place. We have to eliminate conflicts of interest. We cannot have the situation when the British Dietetic Association, which is training our team of dietitians that is going out into the countries to advise people on what they eat, when they are working in partnership with the Sugar Bureau and wrote to me in an email that they are delighted to be so doing. They work with the Flower Advisory Bureau. They work with Birdseye. They work with Danone. And more hideously, in my view, they have just announced Abbott Nutrition as one of their partners. What do Abbott Nutrition make? Soy infant formula. It's basically a mixture of soy and sugars, and that's what they want to give our toddlers. And that's one of their new partners. So get them young, get them hooked on the sugar. Soy, in fact, is a um, birth control pill, in effect. So we put in our 
toddlers on the pill if we're giving them anything with soy. I can give you more on that if anyone is concerned. And fiscal measures. I really do believe that we need fiscal measures because with the food industry placed as they are behind those dietetic associations, with governments compromised and conflicted, not in Wales, I believe. I really do believe we can make a difference in Wales, but in England, Lansley is too close to the food companies. We can put in place fiscal measures, clearly not a fat tax. That would be the most disastrous single move we could make. You've seen from that chart earlier, we would have to tax sunflower seeds and olive oil and red meat and oily fish and not those cakes and biscuits and pastries that they're increasingly taking the fat out of and replacing it with more sugar and more white flour and more low nutrition fattening substances. I would double the price of any product that contains one gram of sugar. What that does immediately is get those food manufacturers to take sugar out of all the products that you may not even realize they put it in. Kidney beans, cottage cheese, yogurt, tins of tomatoes. You would think you could buy some basic foodstuffs without sugar. Have a go next time you're in the supermarket. You'll be surprised how difficult it is. For something that is virtually entirely sugar, don't double the price, multiply it five or sixfold. We have to get things like the sugary sweets that are fed to children priced out of the range of mothers so that there is no pester power at the till. A packet of Haribo costs 20 pounds. It's not in the consideration. Seriously, we have to do something to stop people buying this junk and putting it in our next generation. So we're on the final hurdle now. Unconventional wisdom. We've rattled through a heck of a lot. Thank you so much for staying with me. Obesity is about fat stored. It's not about energy in or energy out. And weight loss is about fat unstored. If you want to lose weight, just think about that absence of glucose and then your body has to use your own body fat. That's what you want to happen. There is no law that says energy in equals energy out. It follows that we didn't eat too much and we didn't do too little. We ate the wrong things and we ate the wrong things because we were told to eat the wrong things. In no way is a calorie a calorie. The protein metabolic advantage is enormous. One pound doesn't equal three and a half thousand calories. We don't know where this came from. We won't lose a pound if we create that deficit. We have no idea where all this came from. There is no formula. I've had people say, but I want a formula. I want to know how much I'm going to lose if I go through this pain. There is no formula. It really isn't. We did a U-turn in our diet advice and increased obesity tenfold. Coincidence or cause? That's for you to decide. We demonise the wrong macronutrient. We actually demonise the right foods, the cakes, the biscuits, the pastries, but call them the wrong things. Saturated fat really is the last thing that they are. They have more protein, they have more water, they have more unsaturated fat. It really is the last thing that they are. And as we've eaten more carbohydrate and less fat, we have got fat and sick in parallel. Now I have this little saying that if you put it on a time scale, back to this three and a half million years Australopithecus Lucy thing, we've been eating real food for about 24 hours. And agriculture, which gave us large scale access to carbohydrates, started about four minutes ago on that hour day time scale. And our consumption of sugar has increased 20 fold in the past five seconds. Which food is most likely responsible for the obesity epidemic? Is it the red meat? that caveman would do his damnedest to try and catch and devour? Or could it be that sugar and flour that is forming the massive part of our daily diet? I'm hoping if there are any people in the audience still hanging on to the view that we just need to eat less and do more, I'm hoping that this final slide might do it. The eat well in inverted commas plate says, please, UK citizens, have 55% of your food in the form of carbohydrate, 30% in the form of fat, 15% in the form of protein. Let's say that we kept fat constant at 30, but flicked out carbon protein. Now, I'm not saying that is a healthy diet, because it's not, but I'm just showing you this by way of illustration, pulling in together all the things that we've learned. Take that Jekia stuff where we look at the thermic effect of nutrients. Remember, for every 100 calories, maybe only 72 are available. I've worked it out precisely for you. That same 2,000 calories on this side, eating only real food, becomes 1,641. Immediately, you've lost almost 400 calories 
in that thermic effect of nutrients. Here you're still at over 1800 because you ate mostly carbohydrates and remember there was very little that it took the body to turn those into energy. Go back to the average woman, 1500 BMR, here's another killer point. The basal metabolic rate can only be fueled by fat, protein, vitamins and minerals. Carbohydrate can help it, not one iota. There is no role for carbs in the basal metabolic rate. So this person, if you add together the fat and protein, has actually not even eaten enough calories to satisfy their basal metabolic needs for the day. This person is woefully deficient because they base their meals on starchy food. They're about 700 calories short in terms of delivering a healthy body for the day. This one, the 500 calories of energy, can come from fat, can come from protein, can come from carbohydrate. This person's eaten 186 in the form of carbohydrate, and this person has eaten twice as many as they need. Same calories, different macronutrient composition. This person is going to lose weight and gain health, and this person is going to get fat and sick. Please don't think a calorie is a calorie. If you do, eat nothing but fat and protein for the next week and see how much weight you lose. Remember the calorie number and repeat it for carbohydrate the week after and see how much weight you gain. And then what happens when we eat something like this? I've circled for you the sugars and I've circled for you some pretty horrible things in red. I mean, carotenoin, sodium alginate, xanthium gum, you know, whatever all of those are. In case you're wondering what it is, it's a diet food. Only three points. 163 calories, absolutely marvellous. If any of you were chuckling, if you ate a sandwich today or a muesli bar, you probably ate that number of ingredients and you probably ate something that you wouldn't recognise. Final slide. I'm actually bang on, that's unbelievable. Barry Groves, I love this quote. Civilised man is the only chronically sick animal on the planet. There is no NHS in the jungle. There are no GP surgeries, there are no giraffes queuing up to be treated for ailments and chronic conditions. We make our pets sick and fat. We can make elephants type 2 diabetic if we put them in captivity. Only man seems to know how to mess everything up. We're the only really sick species. And may I suggest that's because we're the only species clever enough to make our own food and stupid enough to eat it. Thank you very much for listening.